and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we get all the Sinclair news and top-selling Spectrum games from November 1985. I play with a rat. I review some older games, take a look at a newer title, pay a visit to Type In Corner, give you some playing tips, and end with my demo of the month. But first, it's the news. High Street retailer Rumbelows have announced it is to drop the Sinclair Spectrum from its stores. This is a blow to Sinclair, especially as the build-up to Christmas is underway and the Spectrum is Sinclair's top-selling micro. The decision, according to Rumbelows, was caused by the fact that competitor Dixons had pretty much tied up the market with their special Christmas bundle that included a Spectrum Plus and a few extras, all for $139.99. Other retailers, though, including Boots, WH Smith and John Menzies, are also offering their own bundles for the Christmas period, hoping to cash in over the next few months. Sinclair intend to launch two new micros next year, splitting their target audience into two distinct groups. For gamers, they will launch the improved Spectrum in the form of the 1 to 8K machine recently launched in Spain. And for serious business users, there's an improved QL. The new Spectrum will be fully compatible with the existing machine, which is good news for anyone looking to upgrade. A new book covering the life of Clive Sinclair is due to be published by Duckworth Press. The book will cover Clive's business endeavours, both good and bad, and will be called The Sinclair Story. A row is brewing over the money earned from the Soft Aid game compilation released last year. Around £136,000 should have been paid to the charity, but remains in the account owned by Microdealer UK, the distribution company for the compilation. The money has also not been stored in a separate account, but that of a parent company called Spectrum Group. This company has, in the recent months, rationalised its activities, which has raised further concerns over the cash they hold. Microdealer claim there is no written agreement to pay the money in one lump sum, and they will pay it in instalments, although they can't say when this will begin. They have already paid the first lump sum, £150,000, previously, and this row is about the last payment. Solicitors would soon become involved, but Microdealer backtracked and paid the sum in full at the end of the month. The concerns about the Spectrum Group seemed valid, as end-of-year figures showed them to have a pre-tax loss of around £5.1 million. Electric Dreams have licensed the new film Back to the Future and is said to be developing a computer game based around the characters and plot. The game is said to be an arcade adventure and is expected to be launched early next year. And that was the news, and now on to the top selling games. The market is hotting up with Christmas just around the corner and the charts are seeing a large influx of new games. New in this month are Impossible Mission from US Gold. Shadow of the Unicorn from Microgen Monty on the Run from Gremlin Graphics Starquake from Bubblebus Elite from Firebird and Saboteur from Jirel the news and top selling games from November 1985. Back in the good old days of home gaming, if you didn't like using the keyboard, your only option was a joystick. A very popular device with many varieties, designs and features. I covered the different options way back in episode 4, but the joystick themselves remain pretty much the same throughout their life. Some had pistol grips, some had trigger buttons, some had rapid fire options, but at the end of the day, they all plugged into an interface and they all moved the player left, right, up and down and allowed you to fire or jump. Even up to the more modern consoles, if you can call them that, like the original Xbox or PS2, the joystick, or joypad as it had been renamed, still plugged into the unit. It was considered somewhat of a special feature if a console came with a wireless joypad, but now it's considered a bare minimum. This trend isn't something new though, and for the Spectrum, it all started in August 1984, when Cheetah Marketing announced the RAT, 
or to give it its full title, the Remote Action Transmitter. This was an infrared controller, costing nearly £30. Not a joystick, as there wasn't really a stick. Not a joypad, as the term really wasn't mainstream by then, but a controller. The unit had two components, an interface that plugged into the Spectrum, which was not much larger than normal joystick interface, but had a small infrared receiver in it. And the rat itself, a misty grey lump of plastic that looked like it had come straight from the set of a sci-fi film. It was about the same size as a normal television remote control, and worked pretty much in the same way. At one end there were two infrared emitters. It had a four-way pad, despite having markings for eight, and a large single orange fire button. The buttons were not actual buttons. They were similar to the old-style ZX81 keyboard, so there were no mechanical parts inside. It had a battery compartment at the back for a normal PP3 battery, and once fitted, you were ready to go. The best thing that Cheetah did with this unit was to make it Kempston compatible so any game that worked with the normal Kempston joystick would work with this. To test this I entered a simple basic program that printed out the signal on port 31, the port used by the Kempston joystick. I also made it beep if the value was anything other than zero. Running this program and pressing the buttons indicated that the four directions were working fine, and also, as I'd suspected, that there were no diagonal options. There was sometimes a slight delay in response, which could have been down to the age of the unit. Remember, this is over 20 years old. Or it could be just normal delays you get sometimes with infrared. The best test for this device though was obviously a game. So I quickly loaded Arctic's Galaxians and got ready to play. Things worked pretty well, apart from the odd delay. It didn't feel as responsive as using the keys, or indeed a joystick. This sometimes meant that my ship failed to avoid a collision. Not really good for gaming. As I said before, this could be down to the age of the unit, so I can't really claim it's a bad controller, without a brand new one for comparison, which is unlikely. Next I loaded something that needed all directions. Jetpack. And this is where the rat fell short. Moving in all directions meant you constantly had to check your finger positions, and often you missed the buttons, leaving poor old Jetman floundering about. Firing and moving, although it did work, was even trickier, due to the device layout, and needed two hands to make this work, which again was difficult. Overall though, it was a brave effort by Cheetah, and the end result is an attempt to move away from the wired joysticks, and give the player more freedom. It was claimed that it would work 30 feet away, and in my tests this claim proved pretty much true. The interface picked up the signal as far back as I could get it, which was about 5 metres away, but it was impossible to see the actual game at that distance on my 19 inch television. The unit is well designed, and sits nicely in the hand, but it does require two hands to use it properly. The placement of the buttons means it's quite difficult to move and fire at the same time, but the interface does handle it. A novel idea that actually worked, and something that only became expected in the more modern consoles. Good fun to play with, but the odd delay just made it a little bit too slow for accurate gaming. Codemasters released 15 compilations under the Quattro title between 1990 and 1992. Quattro Arcade was released in 1991, and contains four games. Although the compilation is named Arcade, these are strictly not arcade games, more games that you would find in an arcade. There is a difference. Was this a ploy to get people buying the thing? Who knows? Anyway, on to the games themselves, and the first one is Advanced Pinball Simulator. There are quite a few pinball games for the Spectrum, and this is Codemaster's entry into the market. The screen layout has been modified to fit the Spectrum screen, rather than trying to limit it to the same aspect ratio as a real pinball table. This means we get a wider table, and produces more space, allowing for more targets and bonuses, as well as more traps. 
Given the limited memory of the Spectrum, the mechanics are not too bad. The ball sometimes feels like it's rolling in treacle, but apart from that, it plays really nicely. There are set things to hit, and if you delve into the instructions, you will find a backstory about a wizard who is terrorising the country, and you have to find the almanac that contains a spell to destroy him. There are side tasks as well, that involve removing all targets, hitting a range of other targets that spell out things, and the usual pinball stuff. After a few plays, you soon find out what to avoid. The main one is the L and R markers at the top left. Hit these and doors open up at the bottom of the screen that allows the ball to drop out of play. This is annoying, and it's easily triggered. Other markers also produce a block between the flippers. or remove the block. Learn where these are, as this will make the game a lot easier. Being a fan of pinball games, both real and emulated, I found this to be a good game. I enjoyed the gameplay despite a few niggles. The graphics are well drawn and clear, and things move smoothly enough. The control is simple, with Enter to launch the ball and Z and M to operate the flippers. There are some nice tunes in between games, and before you start, but in-game sounds are a bit bland on 48k machines. 1 to 8k users, however, get a lot more varied effects. Overall then, not a bad start to this compilation and a game that can easily eat up an hour or so. On to the next one, Fruit Machine Simulator. Fruit Machine games are multiple and varied on the spectrum, some even appearing as type-ins in magazines, so this is nothing new for the machine. The screen layout hits you full in the face and is packed with lots of buttons, lights, text and masses of other things to distract you. The main things are here of course, the start button, the gamble button, the hold and nudge buttons, and the three rotating wheels. You can add varying amounts of money to play, with the highest amount of £1 giving you 10 plays. Press space and the wheels spin quite realistically, wobbling at the end, and I don't need to explain the rules around these types of game. Getting two or more items in a line will take you to a collect or gamble section, where you try to time your key press to earn more cash. Occasionally you can hold the wheels, and sometimes you can nudge them too. There are things on screen that, even after an hour of playing, never lit up or did anything, and the instructions don't mention them. The compu nudge and stake coin never lit up either, although I did once get a kind of mix between nudge and hold. The graphics are, as you can see, a bit in your face, blocky and confusing at times, especially with the lack of instructions. Sound-wise there's a nice tune, but the in-game effects are limited to beeps of varying tone. Nothing too exciting. There is little to get enthusiastic about here. There's no real money at stake, which is what these games are all about. I suppose it passes a few minutes, but provides no long-term play as far as I can see. Next we have Grand Prix Simulator 2, and this is another in a long line of Codemasters Super Sprint-like games, featuring anything that can move like jet skis, BMX bikes and of course cars. Allowing three simultaneous players, this game is an average version of the arcade game that provides different tracks and a good challenge. You can choose to have any of the three cars as computer controlled, but as usual, these are always much better than you, so you spend a long time wrestling with the controls before you can complete the race within the time limit. Doing this allows you to get onto the next track. The first track isn't too bad, and I actually managed to win the race once after about five or six attempts. The second track is a bit more challenging though. The main problem is one hit from a computer controlled car or bumping into scenery causes your car to grind to a halt, and from this point on you'll never recover. Yes, you can keep going, but all the other cars are now well ahead, sometimes lapping you and even crashing into you again during the process. That again slows you down and makes completing the course impossible. There is damage in this game, so if you run into obstacles or get hit by other cars, your damage increases. Too much damage and your car just stops. A 
The graphics are good as you can see, and things move around smoothly and at a good speed. My initial problem was identifying which my car was, sometimes looking at the wrong one for a while. To get around this I usually tap the left or right controls to see which car moved, but you shouldn't really have to do that. The control was pretty responsive and the cars handled fine, skidding around the corners and reacting to the keys or joysticks instantly. There's a nice tune that plays in between races and a digitised voice counting down the start. During play there's an engine noise too, and the sound when your car hits something. This is not a bad game, I certainly enjoyed it more than Championship Jet Ski Simulator that I reviewed previously, but it can soon become frustrating when your car runs into another time and time again, meaning that there's absolutely no chance of you completing this track. Overall then, an average game that will no doubt get better the more you practice. On to the final game in this compilation, and 3D Starfighter. 3D Starfighter is, as much as I can tell, a slightly more modern version of Quicksilver's Timegate. There are multiple sectors, warping, motherships to dock with instead of planets, and the aim is to clear each sector of aliens. There doesn't seem to be much of a story, apart from your initial main task, which is to destroy a battle star, so it's a 3D shooter with a bit of strategy thrown in. Not much, just docking really. You start off by selecting the first sector, and after you warp, you set about shooting things. The aliens move around unconvincingly, getting larger as they near your ship. They fire large missiles at you, which you have to shoot rather like Star Wars. Your ship flies at a fixed speed, so at least you don't have to worry about that, and you do have a shield that can be used to block aliens or their missiles, but this has a limited time, and replenishes slowly when not in use. Hitting the aliens is tricky, as you have to try and guess where they will be by the time your shot reaches the point you are aiming at, and you end up just shooting anywhere hoping that you'll get lucky, and that one of the aliens will actually fly into your missile. Once you have destroyed all the ships, you warp to the next sector, and have to dock with the mothership. This is made more difficult by more aliens flying about. To dock you simply fly towards the red dot, and keep it in your sights and if you are lucky, you will be allowed to dock. Once there you are given other missions, and this can vary, but it just involves flying to another sector, destroying everything, and docking again. The graphics are fairly basic, with no animation, but the 3D star field is nice. Sound is limited to firing and explosions, and even this is pretty unremarkable. I really can't help but compare this to Timegate, released five years before, and sadly I prefer Quicksilver's Epic than this, Well, that was Quattro Arcade, four mediocre games in one compilation. For me, Pinball was the best of the bunch, but I suppose for three ninety nine, you can't really complain. It's time to plug one of my own games again. Kid Cadet 3, The Iberks Plea. Kid Cadet 3 The Iberks Plea is a game of a game and gives us the third instalment of the Kid Cadet series. The original third game was a platformer and was about 80% complete when I abandoned it, nearly a year ago. This new version rose from the ashes and changed the gameplay into more of a shooter, something along the lines of Exelon. Kid Cadet has inadvertently found himself trying to stop an alien race from launching an attack on Earth. Armed with a simple pulse rifle, he has to find the enemy base and destroy the computer that is controlling the attack. Being unprepared, however, means he only has a limited amount of oxygen. Luckily, there are pods scattered about that help refill his tanks. You control Kid as he moves from left to right across various terrains, avoiding and shooting aliens as he nears the final battle. There are acid bubbles, meteorites, rogue droids and enemy fighters to contend with, not to mention the laser cannon emplacements. It's action all the way. The difficulty is above average, I'd say, and there are times when I actually struggle to complete the game myself. There are 34 screens in total, the last one having a boss battle, that needs several shots to destroy. The graphics are well defined and colourful, and sound is adequate, but does go well with the gameplay. 
why not give it a try? It's free. It's available from my blog straight away and will be available from the World of Spectrum when the updates start again. Welcome to Type In Corner, the place that shows you games not seen for over 20 years. This month's game is Rock Attack, first published in the 1983 April issue of Popular Computing Weekly and written by James Hurrell and Darren Walker. The listing was just short of a full page and contained lots of comparisons and maths. If you couldn't guess from the title, you'll certainly know from the intro screen what type of game this is. Yes, it's an Asteroids clone. An Asteroids clone in basic? Really? How bad is this going to be? Well, to be honest, it's pretty good, especially for a type-in. Most of the arcade elements are there, the rotating ship, the thrust, and the asteroids that split into smaller chunks. In my asteroid shootout from episode 3, there were some commercial games not as good as this, although being in basic, it's never going to be arcade quality, but I was really surprised by this game. This is the first time it's been seen since it was published in 1983, and will be available to download from my blog shortly. Hello, and today we're going to be taking a look at Elite, another great game for the ZX Spectrum. I have two tips for you for Elite today. The first one is a tip that will help you get started because when you first start playing Elite there is nothing more boring than having to trade in safe havens where there's no real fights because your ship's not tooled up enough to take on a big bunch of pirates and all you've got to do is go backwards and forwards between systems spending a lot of time drifting through space letting police fly past you because you can't shoot them just to get a bit of money to tool your ship up so you can start playing the game and having a lot of fun so to avoid all that tedious drifting around in space, what you do is you get some cargo, get your next destination selected, so look on your local map and pick a system that you want to fly to where you think you'll get a good price for your cargo that you've bought, and then you launch from the space station, you exit the space station, and immediately slow down and then turn around and aim to dock back with the space station again. And just before you dock with the space station, you go into hyperspace. And if you time it right so that you hit the hyperspace button and then you would dock with the space station, what happens is you fly through hyperspace and then once you've got through hyperspace, you immediately dock and you will see yourself going through another one of those circle tunnels and docking into the space station at your destination where you can sell your cargo, make profit, buy some more cargo and do exactly the same thing again. This takes a hell of a lot of time out of the start of the game where you're trying to get money to buy extra cargo bays and most importantly docking computers because once you've got a docking computer, I actually see this as a bit of a cheat. Let's face it, it's a bit of a cheat anyway, but once you've got a docking computer, really you should be using that to do your docking. The second tip revolves around which space and how to make sure that you don't run out of fuel in which space. So to enter which space, what you do is you pause the game, press F and you will hear a noise like this. And what that does is it means that next time you enter hyperspace, halfway to your destination, you will be kicked out of hyperspace and you will be attacked by either three or four Thorgoids. While that doesn't sound particularly appealing, what it does mean is that you can clock up kills really, really quickly and get a load of alien items which are worth a load of credits. To get out of which space, you just pause the game again and press F is that while you only get halfway to your destination, you use the full amount of fuel it would have taken to get to your destination. That means that unless you find two planets that are really, really close together, you can only do, say, one jump in which space without getting stranded there. But your fuel scoops are activated when you jump into which space. They keep activated and keep replenishing your fuel supply. 
In this way, you can jump from one Thargoid encounter to another, racking up kills and getting Thargons without ever running out of fuel. Well, that's it for this time. Two tips that I hope will help people with Elite and hopefully get them playing it again. Thank you, till next time. Welcome to Demo of the Month. This month's demo is Aquatic, created by Gemba Boys in 2014. I like this demo for several reasons, mainly because of the design. Most of the effects take place in a small window on screen. This is done to keep the speed up, as there's less screen to update. To do this though, they surround the area with graphics and attribute lines and this goes some way to hiding the fact that it's only a small window doing all the work and this makes the demo look really nice. The music is great too, trying to emulate the sound of waves with a nice tune over the top. The static graphics are nice with some well-drawn sea creatures. The effects consist of a lot of vector work all well done and smooth due to the size of window as previously mentioned. There are some other weird effects as well, all mixed in. I particularly like the shimmering water and wobbling blobs. A great little demo then, I can highly recommend. Go grab yourself a copy now. Well that's the end of this episode, I hope you enjoyed it and thanks for watching. You can get in touch by using the details on screen. See you soon!